Welcome everybody, I'm Pastor Wayne Smith, Prosperity Christ Church, beautiful San Antonio, Texas. It is good to be here today. Hallelujah. As we continue on with Moses this week, last week we talked a little about Moses, but we mainly we talked about Joseph, which we had to get to Moses. So now we're, we're, now we're at Moses. So this is Moses uh, Covenant Part 3. Last week we covered Abraham, a little Isaac, and Jacob, and then a whole lot of Joseph. Through Joseph, we learned that with faith in God and a great attitude because of this faith, we learned that even a slave could rise to second in charge of the most powerful kingdom in the known world. And we learned that nothing impossible is impossible for God to accomplish in our lives. He can take anybody and raise them above their situation at any point if we just keep our trust in him. We also learn that God stands by his covenant children. We learn that we are also his covenant children and we also have the same blessing that was bestowed on Abraham by God. And this denominator is because of Jesus. 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 I love that name. Jesus. 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 And we learn the power of the name of Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Now we'll begin today's teaching. A covenant family becomes a covenant nation. When God remembered his covenant with Abraham after the Israelites were in captivity for 400 years in Egypt, he called Moses to deliver them from bondage or from slavery. Like Noah and Joseph before him, Moses would preserve the bloodline so that one day God's promised seed, Jesus, the Redeemer of all mankind, would come. Although Moses was a Hebrew, an Israelite by birth, Moses had an Egyptian upbringing. Because of a series of divinely directed events, he had been miraculously spared from death as an infant. And because of this, he was raised in a royal household from the time he was a small child. He was a prince of Egypt. So here's a slave boy becoming a prince of Egypt by God's divine hand. Why? Because he had faithful parents. As we see in Exodus 2, 1 through 10, now as a man from a family of Levi married a Levite woman, the woman became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was beautiful, she hid him for three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with asphalt and pitch. She placed the child in it and set it among the reeds by the bank of the Nile, the Nile River that is. Then his sister stood at a distance in order to see what would happen to him. Pharaoh's daughter went down to bathe at the Nile while her servant girl walked along the riverbank. She saw the basket among the reeds, sent her slave girl, took it, opened it, and saw him, the child, and there he was, a little boy crying. She felt sorry for him and said, this is one of the Hebrew boys. Now mind you, that little girl servant that was down by the river was actually, no, excuse me, Moses' sister. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, should I go and call a Hebrew woman who is nursing to nurse the boy for you? Go, Pharaoh's daughter told him. So the girl went and called the boy's mother, which was her mother. Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child and nurse him for me and I will pay your wages. So the woman took the boy and nursed him. When the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses because said, I drew him out of the water. Now you're seeing some amazing things happening here. We see that, that Moses' parents got him back, but this time now he's under the protection of Pharaoh, right? No more guards are going to come in there and kill that child unless they want to die themselves. So a mighty thing is happening here. We're going to learn why all this is happening. Now what has happened here was the, the new Pharaoh had sent out to kill all the firstborn males 
of the Egyptians' household, I mean, of the, of the Hebrews' household, because there were so many and numerous, he feared that they would overthrow Egypt one day. So he was trying to, it was birth control. Basically, what we have today was birth control is what it was. So he went out and they killed all the first born, but this boy was spared. Now, just to catch you up on what's happening, a new Pharaoh, not the Pharaoh that was, that knew Joseph was in charge now. He did not see the Israelite people as a blessing that his ancestors did. So he sees them as a curse. As a matter of fact, he saw them as a threat because how they were so fertile and had so many children. They were outgrowing the Egyptians. Pharaoh feared that one day because of their population, they would overthrow Egypt. So in his not so wise wisdom, he ordered all the firstborn of Israelites to be killed. Well, this wouldn't work out too well down the road because God got really angry and moved on this situation. God put that curse that he put on the Israelites back on the Pharaoh because the, because the Israelites lost their firstborn, so would the Egyptians one day in the near future. Now, remember that Pharaoh, the ten plagues, God hardened his heart. Why did God harden his heart nine, all, all those nine to tenth times? Because God was going to give him what he gave. God was going to give him an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. If you killed my children, I'm fixing to take yours out. And that's exactly what happened. That's why God hardened his heart all the times. He could have made Pharaoh bend his will the first time. But Pharaoh got what he gave. And that's so you can understand why it happened like that. If you ever wonder why God hardened Pharaoh's heart, it was so God could get restitution out of Pharaoh. Not only all the wealth of Egypt to repay the wages for all the years the Israelites lost, but also they lost their firstborn son too, didn't they? And he did it through one of the Israelites' children that should have been killed by Moses. Now God even had the Pharaoh's own house protecting this little boy and raise him right under the Pharaoh's own nose. Isn't that something? Raised him right under the Pharaoh's own and protected this little boy, Moses. Now we will learn soon just what the consequences will be to Pharaoh and Egypt for what they did to God's covenant children. As a young man, Moses had killed an Egyptian citizen while he was trying to defend a Hebrew slave. So even though Moses was raised up in his Egyptian, he still had a heart for the Hebrews, didn't he? He then had to flee to the desert for his life. There Moses became a shepherd, got married, and started his own family. Now things are fixing to get real interesting, so listen real carefully what you're fixing to learn. His wife's name was Zipporah, and his two sons were Gershom and Eleazar. Her father was Jethro, and he was the Cushite priest of Midian, and he was also a shepherd. They lived in the northwestern Arabia or the Gulf of Aqaba. Jethro was also a descendant of Abraham, but not a descendant of Isaac or Ishmael. Most people don't know that. His father-in-law was a descendant of Abraham. Genesis 25, 1 through 2, Abraham had taken another wife who was Keturah, and she bore him Zimron, Joshan, Medan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Jethro descended from Midian and was a Midian priest. Ab Abraham remarried after Sarah's death and started another family with Keturah. This, and this was not forbidden bloodline like Ishmael was. So Abraham's second marriage was blessed and ordained by God while tending sheep near Mount Sinai. Now, known as the mountain of God, Moses encountered the God of the Hebrews for the first time. Speaking to them out of the burning bush, God said in Exodus 3, 6, 8 through 10, then he continued, I am the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. And I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians to bring them from that land to a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the territory of the Canaanites, the Hephthites, Amorites, Prisazites, Hittites, and Jebusites. Therefore go, I am sending you to Pharaoh so that you may lead my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. 
Now notice God identified himself to Moses as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Well, who was the, who was the God of Jacob? God referred to his people as the children of Israel. Why? Because God had changed Jacob's name to Israel during the battle he had with the angel during the wrestling match. Jacob wouldn't let the angel go until God blessed him. So God did bless him and changed his name to Israel, which means prince of my people. And from then on, all the descendants of Israel became the future 12 tribes of Israel. This is why God from the forward called his children the children of Israel. Now Abraham and Keturah had many children, but let's talk about a certain son they had. Let's talk about Midian. And just how important his descendants will be to Moses down the road. You're going to see things start coming together here. Unlike Ishmael, Abraham's other children were sent away with blessing and substance. In Genesis 25, 1, 2, 4 through 6, Abraham had taken another wife whose name was Keturah. And she bore him Zimron, Jokshan, Medan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. And Midian's sons were Ephah, Ephor, Hanak, Albiah, and Elada. Abraham gave everything he owned to Isaac, but Abraham gave gifts to the sons of his concubines. And while he was still alive, he sent them eastward away from his son Isaac to the land of the east. Now Abraham raised all his children in the way of the Lord. That's important to know that the word said he raised them all. So that means they knew about the Lord, okay? Now let's read Genesis 18, 19. For I have chosen him so that he will commit his children and his house after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. This is how the Lord will fulfill to Abraham what he promised. Now let's read me recap this. And his house after him to keep the way of the Lord. Then it says, this is how the Lord will fulfill to Abraham what he promised. So all these things are important to make the promise of what he promised Abraham eventually could become Jesus. All Abraham's children were brought up in the way of the Lord, and that includes Midian. Why is this so important to know? Because all of Abraham's children were brought up in the way of the Lord in the understanding and the knowledge of the Lord. That's what that means. If you bring your children up in the way of the Lord, what does it mean? They know about the Lord, right? You teach them about the Lord. They know the Word of God. They know what you know about the Bible, about God. So there were people worshiping the one true God outside of the Israelites. They weren't the only ones. Look at Meshelzadak. He wasn't an Israelite. Let's find out who he was. Meshelzadak was a descendant of Jophath, Noah's sons. And he was the king of Salem that would one day be Jerusalem. Genesis 14, 18. Meshelzadak, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine and was a priest to God the Most High. So he was a follower of the Most High God. Now, why are we learning who all these descendants are? Because this proves that the Israelites weren't always the only ones who served the God, most, the Most High God. Jethro, also known as Ruel, was also a priest of the Most High God. He was a direct descendant of Midian which was one of Abraham's sons who was brought up in the way of the Lord, just like Isaac was. Jethro was a major player in Moses' future, not just because he became Moses' father-in-law, but because he was a priest of the Most High God. And he taught Moses in the way of the Lord. That's what most people don't realize. Jethro was a big influence. He taught Moses in the way of the Lord. Jethro worshiped and served the God on top of the mountain, which is where Moses encountered the burning bush and met God. So they served. So Jethro served the Most High God before Moses did. Jethro's actions in advising Moses, his preparation of sacrifices. What do you think Moses learned how to do all this? He learned it from Jethro how to make sacrifices. Remember, Moses was a Levite. So he was, had a Levite mother and a Levite father. So he came from the tribe of Levi. Well, he didn't learn how to do sacrifices for the Hebrews in, in Egypt, did he? No. 
He learned it from Jethro. Jethro's position as a priest in Midian and his willingness to praise the Lord all show that Jethro was a priest of Jehovah. Most people get it all wrong. They think Moses wandered into a people who didn't know who Jehovah was. But Jethro did. Uh, Exodus 18.1 clearly says that Jethro was Moses' father-in-law, Jethro the priest of Midian. Now Midian was brought up in the, most, in, in the way of the Lord by Abraham. What kind of priest was Jethro? He was a priest of the Most High God. He was a Midianite. And who was Midian? Midian was Abraham's son who was brought up in the way of the Lord and also in the order of Meshelzadak. Meshelzadak who descended through Enoch, who never died but was taken, taken to God, directly to God, just like Elijah. There's two people in the Bible that never died and was taken straight to heaven, and that was Elijah and that was Enoch. So Jethro was definitely taught the way of the Lord, and he was, he was in the priestly lineage. Moses is the denominator. Moses is who brings all these priests together that are headed straight to Jesus. Moses didn't know the way of the Lord until he met Jethro. Moses was brought up as an Egyptian from childhood. All he knew was about Egyptian gods. He didn't know anything about, about Jehovah. Oh, he must have known that the Hebrews had a God they worshipped, but he didn't know this God until Jethro. So if you ever wonder what happened to Noah's son, Japheth, now you know Japheth's descendants led to Michelle's attack. And Abraham's son, Midian's bloodline, reunited with the bloodline of God's chosen people, the Israelites, through Moses' wife, Zipporah. So you see how it all comes together now? And this order would be the priestly order of the Levites. We see here that God united his priestly order through Moses. Moses was from the tribe of Levi, which is one of the 12 tribes of Israel, the priestly tribe. Now in 1 Chronicles 23, 14, now concerning Moses, the man of God, his sons were named of the tribe of Levi. So now you know why the Levites were chosen as the priestly order. Moses' his mother was a Levite and his father was a Levite and Moses was a Levite. And now Moses married into the family of the priestly order of God through Jethro. So here's how the priestly order came through. Does that make sense to you? So you understand now. It was no accident. It wasn't just a, an instant decision by God. I oh, will just make the Levites the priests. No, the order of Michelle's of that come right through there, through Jethro, right to Moses. And Moses' children were also Levites, correct? And now you understand how the priest order came down to God through Jabeth and Noah's son to Michelle Zedek. And through Abraham's son Midian and through to Jethro. And taken, the, and taken through the tribe of Moses from the Levites. This is the priestly order of Moses. This is how it all came together. By that time, Moses was perfectly prepared to deliver these people out of Egypt and lead them through the wilderness. After 40 years, there he knew the wilderness very, very well. He, there was nowhere they went. He hadn't already been. Everywhere in the wilderness, the Israelites' journey would take them. Moses had already been. He knew exactly where he was going. He knew where the watering holes were. He knew where the pastures were. He knew where everything was. Having given up in, in Pharaoh's house, excuse me, having grown up in Pharaoh's Household, Moses was also well equipped to speak to him. Now, we didn't have a stuttering, Moses didn't have a stuttering problem as many thought. He did tell God when he called him, I am slow to speak and slow and as a slow tongue. Now, why did he say this? In Exodus 4 10, Moses replied to the Lord, Please, Lord, I have never been eloquent, either in the in the past or recently or since you have been speaking to your servant because my mouth and my tongue are sluggish. Why, what does sluggish mean? It means that he, that he hadn't spoken the language in 40 years and was no longer fluent in it. Think about it. He wasn't speaking Hebrew and he wasn't speaking Egyptian. He was speaking Midian. 
Sluggish means not doing doing something well. And we and we are talking about speaking two languages here, Egyptian Hebrew. He hadn't spoken either in 40 years. Of course he was sluggish in that. So yes, he was sluggish in, in speaking these two languages. Just imagine that, that you hadn't spoke Spanish or English in 40 years, and all of a sudden they want you to go up in front of Harvard and give a lecture. You might have some inhibitions about doing this, okay? You may think you're not quite the right person for the job, correct? And this was where Moses stood. Here he's fixing to go stand in front of the king of Egypt and tell him, let them children go. And he hadn't spoke, uh, spoke Egyptian in 40 years. He's sluggish. So we're talking about speaking two different languages here. He hadn't spoken either in 40 years. So yes, he was sluggish in speaking these two languages. With the promise of Aaron, his brother, by his side to speak for him, uh, Moses agreed to go back to Egypt. Now there he confronted Pharaoh for the release of the Israelites. Ten plagues later, with all of Egypt and its people affected, Pharaoh gave him the Moses demand to get the Israelite slaves free and with the wealth of Egypt. After a miraculous crossing of the Red Sea and a three-month journey through the wilderness, God had his covenant family Israel exactly where he wanted them. There were anywhere from one to three million descendants of Abraham gathered at the foot of Mount Sinai, the mountain of God, where they would get reacquainted with the God of their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob's descendants being Israel. And more importantly, they would reestablish their own covenant with God. In Exodus 19, 3, 6, Moses went up to the mountain to God and the Lord called to him from the mountain, this is what you must say to the house of Jacob and explain to the Israelites. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I carried you on the wings of eagles and brought you to myself. Now listen to me and keep my covenant. You will be my own possession out of all the peoples, although the whole earth is mine. Remember that the whole earth is the Lord's, would you ever forget? Even, even things you think you need, believe me, they belong to your father and he wants you to have them. And you will be my kingdom of priests and my holy nation. Now, her, having heard from the Lord, Moses descended the holy mountain and conveyed to the people God's intentions. Very soon these people would have the Ten Commandments with more to come. Those are the beginning of God's covenant with Moses and the children of Israel. Abraham's covenant had been a simple one. God had given him the commandment requirements and instructions, all of them with the promise from God. Genesis 26, 3-5 says, In this land, as an alien, I will be with you and bless you, for I will give all these lands to you and your offspring, and I will confirm the oath that I swear to your father Abraham. I will make your offspring as numerous as the stars in the sky. I will give your offspring all of these lands and all these nations of the earth. You will be blessed by your offspring. Because Abraham listened to me and kept my mandate, my commands, my statutes, and my instructions. Abraham had listened to God and obeyed and had been blessed by God because of this. This shows that obeying God brings blessings into your life. Now that the Israelites numbered into the millions, more was required. It became necessary for God to give them a written covenant, one that would guide them on how to conduct their lives, their families, their businesses, their nations, and even their worship of God. Why? So they could continue to walk in the blessing. Now we will stop here today to continue this teaching on Moses' covenant part three soon. But before we close... I want you to realize how big our God is. He is the Alpha and the Omega in our lives. 
And all he wants to do is lead us to his blessing. All he wanted to do with the Israelites was lead them in the way of the Lord because the way of the Lord is the blessing. We may think it's okay to step out of the way of the Lord or step out of obedience to God, but the obedience to God is the blessing. That is how the blessing comes on us. Before Adam sinned in the garden, he was king of the earth. Do you see that? His obedience made him king of the earth. Our obedience makes our blessing come in our lives and stay in our lives. It's about obedience to God. It's about our love to the Father. That's why it wasn't the, the rules, the, the laws weren't made to punish us. They were made to guide us, to keep us from going left and right, to keep us straight and narrow so that we could receive the blessing, so we could go to God for a healing and receive it, so we could go to God for a miracle and get it, so we could go to our Father and receive what He has. Because when we're in obedience, He is with us. When we're not in obedience, He can't be there. He's given us a way for Him to be there, for Him to be right beside us, to be in us, to be with us in all that we do. What God asks for us is to follow Him, not just by rules, but by love, to love Him. He has a plan for everyone that's better and bigger than you can ever plan for yourself. God will find a way when there is no way. He'll move who he's got to move to move you. Nothing stands in God's way. Nobody, nobody can, can stop God's blessing for you. Oh, it may look like they're going to do it, but I promise you they're going to come in one way and run seven when God gets done with them. And guess who's going to be standing right where they're supposed to be? It's going to be you. Why? Because you're an obedient covenant child of the Most High God, and you belong to his son, Jesus. God is the God of the impossible to be made possible by him. If you can envision it, God can do it. So with God, nothing is impossible. Now, if you don't know Jesus or just fallen away, please repeat these few powerful words after me now. Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins. I ask you into my heart. I now make you my Lord and Savior. Hey, man.